Hello all you football fans and welcome back again to the Shots on Target podcast. My name is Phil, joined by my man Jakey. What's good guys? And this is part two of the World Cup recap. Now um, be sure to follow us on Twitter guys, links down in the description below to find out when we're going to be live. And um, without further ado, let's get right into it. Let's. So, obviously in part one we discussed our predictions, how well things went and how things didn't. Um, and today we're just going to be talking a bit about some of the big moments that we feel um, need to be spoke about about the World Cup itself. So starting off, we're going to speak about Morocco's incredible run to the semi-finals of the World Cup. Indeed, what a record-breaking run. First time incredible. an African team's ever made it to the semi-finals. And the manner that they did it in, going, you know, not losing a game in the groups, only conceding one up until the semis, you know, playing the likes of uh, Belgium playing Spain, two massive teams, and just not rolling over and letting them teams play their football. I yeah. It was, it was certainly such a special campaign for the players and the, the Moroccan fans. It was. And considering they was also in the group with the other semi-finalist Croatia as well mm. and topped that group, like they didn't lose a game in, in the groups. Um, and obviously, do well, they didn't lose a game until they eventually got knocked out in the semi finals to France. Which, I mean, if anyone watched that game, Morocco could have easily won that game as well. Yeah. It was just an incredible run. I mean, just to name some um, star performers for me personally, you had Mazraoui, was fantastic. You had Unahi, um, who was the Amrabat, that's the one I was thinking of. Amrabat was incredible as well. CH I think it, had a great tournament as well. CH, CH was good as well. Yeah, their keeper. I can't remember his Bonu. name. or Bonu, that was it. He's a great keeper. I don't know how no one's picked him up yet. Yeah, he was fantastic. He was fantastic. But just the way they set out about the World Cup, I always said, and I still do believe this, you can't defend for 90 minutes and win a game of football. I do still believe that. But Morocco did it in a way where they wasn't just defending. They defended up until a certain point and then they wanted to attack you. Mm. And they attacked you with pace as well. They had pace down the wings. They put you under a lot of pressure. They didn't let up whatsoever. It wasn't a case that they just sat back in an 11 and allowed you to control the ball and break you down. Once you got past, say, the halfway line, a team, they were on you instantly. Mm. Um. And it was just fantastic to watch. Honestly, it was the one of the biggest moments of the World Cup was their run all the way to the semi-finals. No one predicted it whatsoever. The teams they beat to get there as well. Switzerland um, obviously um, got knocked out by Portugal 6-1 and then um, Morocco came to Portugal and beat them 1-0. Like, crazy, crazy stuff. <laughs> incredible, honestly. <laughs> As you say as well, Spain, they, um, obviously for anyone watching that game, Spain just could not break them down. I mean, Spain probably dominated that game for the whole time, let's be honest. 100%, yeah. Um, they just didn't have an end product. They had chances, Spain, to stop Morocco's fantastic run right before it even got going. Um, but they rode their luck, Morocco, in that one. They defended well as a team got all the way to penalties and then destroyed them in a shootout. I said that was an awful showing from Spain in terms of penalties. Oh, 100%. Not scoring one. Not good at all. And uh, to be fair, for penalties as a whole, it was quite a poor showing from a lot of teams. Yeah, it was. It, it really it really was. Um, I mean, Brazil's penalties were awful. France's Japan penalties were awful. <laughs> Japan's penalties were probably some of the worst I've ever mm. seen against Croatia. My God, they just looked like five tired penalties. Yeah. Really, really just tired penalties. And let's be honest, Japan did really well to take Croatia to penalties, yeah. considering how far Croatia eventually went. Um, but again, Croatia got that far through the shootouts. Japan, Brazil, both on penalties. Um, but obviously, speaking a bit more about Morocco itself. Um, I remember 
Conte in an interview uh, with their coach after the first game, and he said, um, this is just the start. Like, he knew something special was happening in that Moroccan camp. And, my God, did they prove it. Oh, 100%. It's incredible. And also another standout performer that we forgot to mention, is probably one of the best um, players in the world at the minute, is Hakimi. Oh, yeah, 100%. It completely slipped my mind. Because when you said hey. Mad Rabi, I thought, oh, yeah, he probably played most of the minutes. Just yeah. to say, the absolute balls to pull off that Penenka in... Oh, God, yeah, I remember that. The yeah. stones it takes to pull that off. That was just insane. Absolutely just insane. Mental. But yeah, he, he was probably easily one of Moroccan's best players. 100%. He was probably one of the only players in the World Cup that was looking forward to a showdown with Mbappe as well, even yeah. though it didn't it di- even though it didn't go his way. I mean, Mbappe didn't really do Well, in much in, in terms of against but... Mbappe, I think it went his way. <laughs> oh, 100%. It's not like Mbappe had the better of him and mm. As I say, if you watch that game, if Morocco had a finisher in that game, they could have easily knocked out France. They were fantastic against France as well. 100%. They, A lot of teams bow out. Um, they have a fantastic run and they just put their hands up and go, the better team won that day. I still don't believe that. I still think Morocco was not better than France, but at least on par with them in that game. Yeah. Like, the, the, goal, the goals France scored was... Um, one goal from uh, Hernandez where the ball just ends up at the back post. Luckily, he's there to send it home. And then you have the deflected goal at, right at the end when Morocco are pushing for the equaliser and they were split open. And even that, it was a deflected goal that puts puts it in. I mean, it's unfortunate for Morocco, but what a showing. Yeah, it just definitely won't be the last showing. we'll see of that Moroccan team either. They've got, oh, go, definitely. Go I, 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 They've got such a good set of players. I hope not anyway, because you do see it a lot of the times. It's like um, Greece when they won the Euros in 2004. I mean, yeah. what have Greece done since then? Do you know what I mean? It's Hopefully those things. qualify for another time, I don't think. Uh, maybe one, I don't know. But it's those insane runs that just, just makes the World Cup what it is. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. There's always one team that surprises you so much. And it, even just getting into the knockouts is fantastic for a team like Morocco. But to take it all the way to the semi-finals of the World Cup. Some, some That's a feat that some countries have even struggled to do over the years. England being one of them, do you know what I mean? Like, it, it's hard to do. And the teams they've beaten along the way as well. Incredible. Absolutely incredible. 100%. But speaking of England, we'll be moving on now to England's performance over the whole World Cup. How do you think... It went for them. What do you think should have been done differently? Where do you think needs to be improved for the future? Uh, I thought for a lot of the tournament, I thought we were shaky. You know, I don't think we played awfully. I don't think we played exceptionally well. I think to start off with a 6-2 win against Iran is brilliant, yeah. But the fact that we still conceded two against Iran shows already signs that we were weak at the back. You know... Any other team probably punished us more. Um, uh, to, making it out of the groups, yeah, I think it w- it was never a doubt we were going to make it out of the groups. I think, you know, drawing to the USA wasn't great, but ultimately, in no disrespect to Wales at all, we were going to beat Wales. But I think th- there were a lot of things that could have gone differently. I think a lot of things that... I, I don't think South gets the mandate taking them forward. And I never have, uh, even when we got to the final of the Euros, I said that if England were to say goodbye to Southgate, I don't think that would have been, you know, the the wrong decision. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, you, you're seeing it, like, with what United went through with Oregon and Solskjaer, yeah, if they had just said goodbye to him after that final, I don't think it would have been the wrong decision. I, I don't think many people would have had, like, bad things to say. Um. His substitutions left left a lot to be desired. I don't think he made the right substitution once. Um, ultimately, taking too many attackers and not enough midfielders ended up costing us because I thought a lot of the games that we did play, when it got to like the sixtieth minute, uh, especially with Jude and Rice playing near enough every minute of the tournament, it was they were going to get tired and they did. 
And I yeah. think, you know, ultimately it, it came down to France beating us in a game where for the second half I'd say we were the better team, but we didn't take our chances. You know, you can point the fingers at the referee or whoever. We had two penalties. We ultimately missed one of them. We had our chances. We didn't take them. True. And uh, I, think, true. I think, you know, come the Euros, we might see a different manager. We might see a different, you know, group that he takes. A lot of youngsters, like English youngsters coming through. I know that... Um, Chelsea... I think we'll see a different manager. I think, he's, I think he's already signed for the next Euros. Yeah. Well, hopefully we see a different outlook on who he takes. I think James Ward probably deserved to go. There were a lot of midfielders that deserved to go that weren't taken. I didn't see yeah. the point of him taking <clears throat> three strikers when he was never going to play a two up top system. Yeah, I mean, he took James Madison and the guy never got a minute. So. Which is criminal because he had such a good season. It is. It is. I mean, it's. it's, it's I think it's. Like it, it, as much as we can all slate off Southgate it is the one of the most difficult jobs in the world managing England especially these days it used to be tough obviously back when you had your your Lampard Gerard Rooney Beckham etc but now I think it's even worse for Southgate because he's got such talent at his disposal and the pressure is so high to perform that when one mistake happens it just looks like it's the biggest mistake in the world and don't get me wrong. There is a lot to say about England from my point of view. Just going, starting with the group stages, I thought we were good um, and looked very um, confident in the Iran game. As you say, we see the two goals, so it does show that we lack at the back. Um, the USA game, I generally believe they just wanted a game off. I think they were just, we'll, we'll, fight, we'll draw with USA and then we'll go and beat Wales and then we'll top the group. Um, Let's be honest, that USA game was a write-off. Um, then you get to the Wales game, and uh, for me, uh, a star emerges in Marcus Rashford. I thought he was absolutely incredible. Um, considering when we play a team from around us, like, say, your Wales, your Scotland, your Ireland and stuff, there's always a bigger aspect put onto it. And there's always that bit of doubt, because obviously... In the Euros that where we made the the final, we ended up drawing to Scotland. So there's there's different question marks that can be said, but I would say that in terms of the whole run, as as the whole for the World Cup, obviously it wasn't the greatest showing from England. I mean, everyone expected us to make it to the quarters and play France, which is obviously what we did. Um, the Senegal game we played very well. We just they we were the better team, but for the first fifteen twenty minutes we were the, we were the second best team. Senegal should have been two 0 up, and then we're so we're talking a whole different story. England notoriously started slow in a lot of these games in the World Cup. It was like Tottenham these days, um, but obviously we get. We'll t I'll talk a little bit about the France game from my point of view. Um, I think Southgate made all the wrong decisions in that game, which he probably put his hands up and he knows that. I mean, Saka had um, had that um, guy on strings all game. I think it was Hernandez. Um, he literally had him on strings all game. He was tormenting him. Should have had a penalty. Wasn't given. I mean, like you say, we could talk about the referee's decisions all we want, but we had the chances. Um and then when France go 1-0 up through an absolute worldie through Shuameni, like, you sit back and go, well, that can only happen against England. Um, but the Reds didn't go down. They carried on going. And then the second half, we looked a better team. Obviously, eventually get the penalty, um, which Kane puts away. Um, and then from that point of view, everyone's just screaming at Southgate, make positive changes, let's go and attack them their heads are down this is france and we are battering them let's go and take the game to them and the decisions he made were just absolutely criminal like i see he takes off saka um and all the changes he made for me they were just um he was reacting they weren't positive he wasn't um trying to be um proactive he was just reacting to the situation like France go 2-1 up thanks to a fantastic cross from Griezmann and a great head by Giroud. Um, and at that point, then we're back on the back foot when for 25 minutes we've been on the front foot. 
we get a stroke of luck where Hernandez just wipes out, um, I think it was Saka. Rashford. Um, oh, Rashford, sorry. Um, and we get we get a saving grace again. We get another penalty. How that we wasn't get... a red, by the way, is beyond me. Uh, I think it's because it wasn't a clear goal scoring opportunity. Like he so was never going. Yeah, but it's the rule state has to be a clear goal scoring opportunity for a straight red. Mm. Um, but yeah, um, and obviously our main man steps up, and I'd, I'm going to point this out right now for a lot of English people because I know there was so much talk about why is Kane taking a second penalty. You look at the players that were on that pitch at that time. There is no one in hindsight I would want more to take that penalty than Harry Kane. Not. A single doubt in my mind. He just missed one. It's that simple. 99 times out of 100, he will score that penalty. He is prolific from the spot. Mm. And he showed that with his first penalty. And fair play to him. He had the balls to step up for a second time. There's plenty of people that have taken two penalties in a game and slotted them both. Just because he missed doesn't mean it was the wrong decision. Like people were saying, oh, um, Jude should have took it or Saka should have took it. And this is the same people that were probably slating off Saka for missing a penalty in the Euros final. Like, mind-blowing to me. But, as I say, as a whole, it was obviously a poor showing for England because a lot of people had high hopes, especially with the group of players. And going forward, as I say, Southgate will be with us for the Euros, so it's going to be interesting to see what he does for that. I mean, there's some very good kids once again coming through for England. Um, and Ketty is one of them. Um, but obviously, he's a striker. Probably won't play in front of Harry Kane. But, you know. But anyway, I think I've spoken enough about that. Apologies for boring you guys there. But I had a lot to get off my chest there. It's been a while. It's been brewing. But anyway, moving on, we're going to talk about USA and Australia making out of the groups and into the knockouts for the first time. Yeah, massive achievement for the both of them. Obviously, like as we know, the USA football isn't the main sport over there. I think a lot of the USA fans know that. I so, mean, they call it soccer, for God's sake. They call it soccer. Honestly, I don't want to see any of that slander. No shot. No, thank you. But, um, yeah, I think, you know... They've got a promising group of players over in the States. They've got, obviously, uh, Pulisic, who I think had a great tournament. Um, obviously, you've got like the likes of McKenney in midfield. I can't name too many more. I don't know Tyler Adams, who plays for Leeds. Other than that, I couldn't really name any more. But... I mean, they, yeah, they've got a couple. I mean... Uh... The the main thing for me was the the two they made it out of the group because they worked hard they yeah. worked hard and they they um like Morocco they they worked hard and they took their chances I mean Australia only lost two one to Argentina and Argentina were probably flying at that point like mm. so I mean both fantastic performances to make out of the groups and they'll see that as good tournaments for both countries so that's that's great for them oh, um, and obviously. Um, that one Argentina player got Messi's shirt. Uh, uh, sorry, Australia player got Messi's shirt. So he was buzzing about that. Um, any would be getting his shirt. Oh, definitely. Well, apparently not Tyler Adams. Apparently Tyler Adams doesn't take other people's shirts. He said, "Why would I want other people's shirts when it's not mine?" But, yeah. I don't get that. Must be each, an American each, thing. Each to their own. Must be an American thing. Must be. But moving on. Um, we're going to talk about Brazil's underperforming World Cup. Yeah, I think uh, it'll be one that they look back on and use as a, a big point of reflection rather than one they can look back and say, yeah, we did well. I think, you know, ultimately this is Neymar's last big tournament for Brazil. I can't see him still being there in 2026. There's a possibility, but I um, How old would he be? 37, 36? 36, I think. 36. Yeah. Um, it's a possibility. It's a possibility, but I can't really see it. Um, yeah, I think ultimately, you know, I don't think they played awfully. I think it's a tournament they'll look back on as a performance standpoint. They only really underperformed in one game, and that was ultimately the Croatia game that they went out on. Yeah. And, you know, going out on penalties is no real shame on going out on penalties because it's ultimately you're not guaranteed to win it is the only thing in football that's never a guarantee 
you could get battered for 90 minutes or 120 minutes as the World Cup was, go to penalties and knock them out. It's one of it's one of them. It's a, a complete coin toss on who goes through in a penalty shootout with who's better on at that. It's true, yeah. Thing in football. I think one of the biggest things though for that uh, Brazil Croatia game though was everyone um like knew that it never should have gone that far. Yeah. Um I mean, you look at Brazil as a whole over the tournament and um I mean they were looking good in the group stages. They won both their games solidly and then they obviously played their B team in the third game because there was nothing on it. They probably should have won that one as well. Yeah. Um and obviously uh, lost that. So that was their first loss in, I think, so many odd games as well, like Argentina. Um, but then you come to the knockouts and they easily dispatch South Korea and they're looking fantastic doing it. Everyone's raving about Brazil. Like, this is the team we expect to see from Brazil. And then they go into the quarters and, I don't know, something was something was off that game. Um, obviously, one of the biggest key was Neymar being off. He was yeah. just, other than the goal he scored, he was just non-existent. But you keep a player like Neymar on for moments like that. I mean, let's, don't, let's be honest, that goal was incredible. Oh, yeah. The goal he scored was just out of this world. To break down a team like Croatia, who were set on defending, and then to do that to them. But then, at that point, you've got 10 minutes left. And it, like I said in the previous episode, a team like Brazil should have just been able to keep the ball for 10 minutes, make it through to the next round, play Argentina, which is everyone's game that everyone would have loved to see. That would have made the World Cup even better. Even though the World Cup was insane, that would have been even better because it would have been Messi versus Neymar, the Battle of South America again. It would have been a chance for Brazil to right the wrong of the Copa America or the exactly. uh, final summer. So many different storylines that was mm. written there. And I think when Brazil went 1-0 up, everyone was like, here we go, Brazil versus Argentina, and they were like rubbing their hands together sort of thing. But Croatia were like, nope, that's not how this story's going to go. Mm. And, yeah, like you say, it was obviously the coin flip of the penalties, but for me, it should have never gone that far. Oh, and Brazil, Brazil will see this as an underwhelming tournament. Um, I do believe, though, that, like you say, Messi, um, sorry, Neymar might not be at the next World Cup. I don't think it would je- necessarily be the worst thing in the world for Brazil, because I think they actually play better without Neymar. Yeah, I've always so, said that. When you've got a player as good as that, you always look to them when things don't go your way. And if they're having an off game, you've got nothing going forward at that point. Exactly. I remember we were the same with Coutinho before he left, and we were the same with Gerard when he before he left. We always looked to them when shit weren't going right. And if they can't yeah. do it, then you'll you, 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 100%. Well, it's like the same with Argentina for years. They've just laid on Messi, and sometimes Messi just, it's just not been in his locker, but sometimes it is, i.e. I. this year. Yeah. So, but lastly, we're going to talk about Brazil's golden generation officially over. Now, I say Belgium? officially over. Sorry? Do you mean Belgium? Did I say Brazil? Yeah. <laughs> Love Brazil, me. <mate. laughs> Sorry, Belgium's golden generation officially over. Now, when I say go, um, officially over, um, I mean, I think it has been yeah. for a couple of years now. But I think this was the the one where it was like, okay, yep, they're done. This was the nail in the coffin. Yeah, 100%. I think I, I ultimately think it comes down... I don't think it comes so much down to the players. Obviously, the players are going to take a part because they didn't perform. Uh, I think it's... A big part of the player is on Roberto Martinez. I think that's, interesting. that's he, interesting. I think he is such an average manager, and I don't think he's ever been able to get the best out of that Belgium team. Well, that's, that, that's actually very interesting considering he's now taken the Portugal job. So, and I don't know how his agent keeps getting him these jobs. Nah, no idea, no idea. I mean, the guy used to manage Wigan. I mean, right. like people can say, yeah, he won the <laughs> FA, he won the FA Cup with Wigan, which was a great achievement. He also did get Wigan relegated. Um, and like ultimately, I don't think he's not a World Cup quality manager, like the no, likes was... of uh, Hansi Flick were, or Joachim Lau, or um, yeah. obviously Scalini with Argentina and Deschamps for France. He's not that caliber of manager 
and to not get I don't even think they've made the quarters have they once under his management yeah yeah they made the semis once oh did they yeah ah oh. well to never get past the semis in itself with the likes of De Bruyne Courtois Hazard Lukaku less about Lukaku the better but you know oh yeah you got you got to think as well though so like two tournaments ago in um I think it was 2012 no 20 2012 no sorry 20 hold on so yeah 2014 sorry yeah that that was the first world cup where the the belgian golden generation officially like hit the scene and you're talking about players that were absolutely in in their prime you had the hazards you had de bruyne as like you say you had vincent company back there yeah. i mean that was the biggest one everyone expected belgium to do a lot better than they did um but yeah i completely agree with you about the manager um and it just makes me wonder because i see england going down that same route yeah literally like because the some managers are just born to get the best out of players you look at your guardiolas etc um and some managers just just aren't and they're given a group and of players that they they are oh, what do I do with these? Do you know what I mean? And it just seems like they have no no idea what to do. And you can see that in Belgium, hundred yeah. percent. They had no idea what to do. It seemed like get the ball to KDB and hopefully he does something incredible. And some it didn't, work. Said, it, it didn't work. No, I mean some of the World Cup um, KDB. I think there was just there was just terrible atmosphere in that um, Belgian camp. I mean. Um, I mean, you've seen it after the, um, after the tournament when they went out, like, but De Bruyne came out saying, like, what more do you expect? We're not good enough. Yeah, well, no, I think he came out and said that during the tournament. They were still in the tournament when he came oh, out and said it? that. Yeah, it was, in, it was an interview with him and Vertonghen, I think, and um, he got asked, what do you think is going wrong? And I think, like you say, De Bruyne said, like, um, what, do you, what do you expect when we're just not good enough? Or something along those yeah. lines. Um, and I think from that moment on, it was like, right, well, bye, Belgium. You're not, nothing's happening here. Do you know what I mean? And that's that. Like, um, he'd obviously lost the dressing room at that point, um, the manager, and it just did not go well whatsoever. It's a worrying time for Belgium as well, because if you look at the players coming through, there's not many that you would like really look at and say, like, yeah, our future's secure with these players. Obviously, you've got the that um, youngster that plays for AC Milan now, the, I think his name's like Dick Catalea or something like that. Mm -hmm, I yeah. can't pronounce it properly, but he looks like a talent. But really, you the got... quality's dropped. Yeah. It, I think really um, I think personally um, that comes down to just Belgium as a whole. I think their grassroots are struggling because they used mm. to pump out talent all the fucking time. Now I mean, you, you look at like Hazard, De Bruyne, Courtois, company. Um, yeah. I'm gonna throw in Origi because I love him, but <laughs> yeah, but they've had players that could have easily been world class. Uh, Tielemans. Um, yeah uh it's like um I'm trying to think they had that um witzel and oh they've they had so much talent lukaku could have been a well should have has, been has been has been a world-class striker in uh, in times but like just incredible honestly but that's gonna do it guys for yeah. part two of the world cup recap um as i say um we're gonna do three or four parts for this um so make sure to keep an eye out for the next part um obviously follow our twitter with the link down below in the description and we will catch you for the next part see, see you guys peace